to welcome to this Meanwhile Nearby about Rosedale during the Industrial Revolution. I'm here at the kilns at Bank Top, um, at the top of what's known as Chimney Bank because there used to be a large industrial chimney here. And in this video I'm going to talk to you about Rosedale and I'm going to talk to you about all the industrial heritage that we can see in our local area. So this video is about Rosedale during the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so the landscape and environment of Rosedale was totally transformed during the Industrial Revolution. Um, it was found here some rich ironstone uh, and it was subsequently mined and that led to huge changes to Rosedale. And we can still see the archaeological evidence of this in and around Rosedale today. Now, if you look at those maps, some of the places that we're going to be learning about um, within this meanwhile nearby are places like uh, Bank Top or Chimney Bank, Sheriff's Pit, which was um, one of the mines in Rosedale during this time. We're going to find out about Blakey Junction, which is where the Rosedale Railway um, kind of came together and then went across the moors, across Farndale, and uh, then went down the Ingleby Incline um, and then through Battersby Junction, where it met the main railway line and into Middlesbrough and Teesside. We're going to find out a little bit more about that. We're also going to find out about the East Mines as well. Here just shows you a map of the North York Moors and we can see some of those different um, locations and we can see the lines of those red arrows shows us where the Rosedale Railway went all around um, Rosedale during the Industrial Revolution in order to transport ironstone. So let's find out more. So we're going to look at some keywords during this learning um, and you're going to write down a definition of those. So we're going to find out about calcining, a drift mine, ironstone, the Ingleby incline, kilns and navvies. The rural dale of Rosedale actually, actually has a long history of industry even before the Industrial Revolution. So ironstone was extracted from early medieval times and it was smelted in small isolated bloomeries which are furnaces for smelting iron. Building stone was quarried and jet mining also took place and you might remember the importance of jet stone to places like Whitby for example. Coal was extracted from the local moors through shallow shaft mining, which basically just means uh, mines that are not particularly deep until the 19th century. And even during Tudor times, French immigrants um, established glassworks at the southern end of the Dale. And we can see there a picture of Rosedale, uh, and that's the history um, of this place that we're going to be looking at in this meanwhile uh, nearby. Okay, so mining of ironstone began at Gromont in 1836, and the discovery of the main iron seam in the Eston Hills in 1850 sparked off the Cleveland iron industry, leading to widespread searching for more, which is known as prospecting, uh, and further discoveries of ironstone. Uh, now, the Eston Hills are actually quite a bit north of Rosedale towards Middlesbrough, and we can see a picture there of the Eston Hills with Middlesbrough in the background. Uh, but two huge masses of ironstone were found at Rosedale, which are 40% iron content was superior in quality to other sources of ironstone, where the stone perhaps had about 15, maybe 20% um, of iron in it. So this led to an iron rush around, rise, uh, around Rosedale. Now, by 1870, the Cleveland ironstone industry supplied 38% of Britain's iron and steel industry. Much of the steel was traded through Teesside into Middlesbrough, leading to a huge growth in the town during the Industrial Revolution, and a railway was built which actually linked Rosedale all the way to Middlesbrough. So how did mining work at Rosedale? Well, basically, ironstone was taken from mines. These were normally what are called drift mines, but they could um, be the more typical shaft mines as well. And it was tipped into the kilns. Uh, now, kilns are types of ovens, and the ore was mixed with coal and roasted in these kilns and these ovens in a process called calcining. This removed impurities and reduced weight. The hot stone was then put into waiting wagons on the train line, and the ironstone was then taken out across the moors for onward transport via Blakey Junction to the blast furnaces on Teesside via the newly constructed Rosedale Railway. Now the Rosedale Railway went around the Dale and it took ironstone via Blakey Junction all the way to blast furnaces at Teesside and we can see there some of the old rail lines um, and we can still see the archaeological evidence in the land and the environment today for where that Rosedale Railway actually was. 
Now, the first mines at Rosedale opened at a place called Holland's Drift at Rosedale West Side in 1856, just below what we now call Chimney Bank, the bank top. Now, the iron was hauled by a steam winding engine up an inclined tramway to bank top and then processed in the giant kilns that we can see there. The ironstone attracted big industrial investment due to the high content of the iron. Remember, it's 40 percent. The York MP, George Lehman and railway magnate, joined forces with Alexander Sheriff, a Worcestershire MP, and Isaac Harters, owner of the local Relton Iron Works. In 1861, a railway to transport the valuable ironstone was opened with an 11 and a half mile stretch from Rosedale to the Ingleby Incline, running across the deserted moorland landscape. And you can see there a map of the Rosedale Railway that went almost all the way round uh, Rosedale itself. And you can actually travel uh, round Rosedale now on that um, old uh, railway line and you can get a real sense for the geography of the place. And you can see where the embankments were, were built um, to actually allow the train to travel all the way round Rosedale. Okay, now Rosedale was home to a number of mines and this photograph shows the Hollands mine and the associated railway incline to Rosedale Bank Top and the calcining kiln and just at the top there and you can see the labels for, for both of those places where those uh, mines and the kilns were. Now, the Rosedale Railway and the kilns were built by navvies or navigators, and they were manual workers who travelled the country working on construction projects and living on site. The line to Bank Top was built in 1861 with pick, shovel and wheelbarrow, and it took only 15 months to complete. The line to the east kilns required high embankments and inclines and was also built by hand in 1865. Now, the railway connected onto a place called Battersby Junction and then onto the processing plants of Cleveland, including in Middlesbrough and also to Durham as well. By 1865 the railway linked both sides of the Dale and mining activity increased massively. Now the navvies lived in communal turf huts along the railway and when the job was finished the huts were simply left to decay and the navvies left. Now the navvy cottages at Ro Rosedale um, largely have um, their foundations surviving um, and they were grassed over as well but they helped to show the lifestyle that these hard workers endured. The navvies were indispensable to the construction of buildings and structures throughout Great Britain at the time, particularly its railways, not just in Rosedale, but across the country. Now, we're just going to watch a short video clip from the actual Rosedale site where you can get a really good impression for how impressive the work of the navvies actually was. OK, so we're at the head of the valley here and you can really get a sense of the scale of this human achievement during the Industrial Revolution to build a railway that went all the way around this valley, bringing that precious and wonderful ironstone um, all the way from Rosedale in the North York Moors, right through, uh, through Blaker Junction, down the Ingleby Incline and into Teesside to power the Industrial Revolution. You don't think about it now, about how quiet and how beautiful this valley was, but this was a hive of activity. Now, Rosedale would have changed a lot during the Industrial Revolution. The influx of new people must have been daunting for the existing community. More than 100 miners and railwaymen's cottages were built, such as the ones on Florence Terrace that you can see below. And you can see four of the cottages still survive today. Now, benefits came due to there being more schools and chapels and more money was spent in the two inns uh, in Rosedale uh, Abbey. There was a greater variety of goods in the shops and money poured into Rosedale. Um, the actual village itself, Rosedale Abbey Village, was almost wholly rebuilt. So now, some of the newcomers' behaviour was poor and so a policeman was employed. Police cells were opened for offenders to cool off before being sent to the magistrate's court of pickering. Many tenant farmers, however, continued to live in poverty during this time period, although sometimes family members would be employed in the mining industry. Over 10 million tonnes of iron ore were transported across the bleak, often snow-covered moors in the course of the railway's 68-year history. The population rose from 755 to 3,024. There were periods of high production, such as during the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s and the First World War from 1914 to 1918. But after the First World War, demand tailed off and led to a decline in the 1920s, coupled with the fact that a lot of the iron ore had already been removed. By the 1920s, the price of iron dropped. Selling off the calcine waste heaps briefly revised, revived industry in Rosedale. However, in 1926, the general strike closed down the industry. It never recovered. And by 1929, the industry was over. 
the railway line was sold off and all the equipment and the population dropped back to 498. Today, Rosedale is once again a beautiful, peaceful and rural place. Visitors who walk, cycle um, and go along the railway line today are often unaware of Rosedale's links with the Industrial Revolution. Rosedale's magnetic high-grade ironstone had been important to iron production in Cleveland and Durham. And the remains of those giant kilns dominate the landscape. And the dale is marked in many places by ruined dwellings, sometimes only foundations. The remaining cottages in Rosedale uh, village make comfortable homes and, of course, Farming continues in Rosedale and tourism is, of course, important. And the environment is now dominated by clear air and rare plant species and animals and what was once a heavy industrial landscape. So we're going to look at some of the locations around Rosedale today where you can find out more about the history of Rosedale um, and the Industrial Revolution. The historic environment allows you to take yourself back in time to an era when Rosedale was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution and the Cleveland iron industry. Now in this picture, we can see the calcine works, um, Rosedale uh, iron kilns, empty wagons stand ready to receive calcine dust in this photograph from 1927. Now 230,000 tons of calcine dust was removed from Rosedale after the end of the ironstone mining in 1926. After the calcine dust was removed, it was the turn of the railway line itself before nature reclaimed the land. We're going to look around some of the remains, especially if you want to go and have a little walk around Rosedale. You can have a look at some of these different places. So the first location is Rosedale Bank Top. Um, these are the remains of the calcining kilns at Bank Top that you can see there with those archways. Now, there was a large industrial chimney on this site, which gave the bank the name Chimney Bank. It's one of the steepest roads in England going up there. Um, it's known as the Chain Breaker by cyclists. Now, the chimney was built in 1860 to serve the boiler plant on the open moor top of Above the West Mines. The chimney, though, had to be demolished in 1972 as it was becoming unsafe. Now, Bank Top was a centre for processing and transporting ironstone. Bank Top also included coal depots, railway workers, cottages, and an engine shed. Now, production at Hollins, the, uh, the Hollins mine just below Bank Top, peaked quickly and the mines were abandoned in 1885. You can see here where the bank top terminus was and uh, we can see um, the snow plows even there as well. And then we can see a modern day picture there. So if you go to bank top now, that will be a familiar image for you. And you can almost imagine where the train line was and where the little track is there, which actually leads you to, to bank top itself. And you can still see some of the remaining uh, houses there as well. This was an engine shed, which was at the uh, at Bank Top as well, which of course is no longer there now. Um, but this is the very location where uh, that engine shed actually was. And this was a view inside the engine shed. And actually, if you look at the ground carefully, you can still see the inspection pits um, in the ground today, where there's a little dip in the ground. So if you see that, that's why there is that little dip in the ground at the top of the Bank, uh, bank Top nowadays. And you can also get an impression here really clearly. It's the same land, but in each picture, 1900 and today, you can see uh, where the rail, railway line would have been and where the trains would have been um, at, the, at the top, at Bank Top. So going on to talk about Rosedale's um, Sheriff's Pits. So the Rosedale um, Sheriff's Pits began in 1857 as a drift mine, which basically means that you sort of walk into the mine, you sort of dig into the hillside. The mine also then reopened in 1875 as an ironstone shaft mine, which means you basically dig a big hole down into the ground. Now the mine was named after a man called Alexander Clune Sheriff of the Rosedale Mining Company. Now Sheriff's Pit closed in 1911 and the environment returned to nature. Today the mine is physically fenced off, there's one surviving corner of the former mine manager's house next to the Rosedale Railway uh, walkway. Now, only two families lived on site at Sheriff's Pit, um, the mine manager and his deputy. The rest of the miners travelled here each day across the moors on foot or by donkey in every kind of weather and every kind of season. They brought food for their shift in what were known as bait boxes, and they often contained a pasty filled with bacon or cheese. They sometimes had circles of pastry studded with currants, which were known as sad cakes, and they were quite popular. So here's a picture of the photograph of the entrance to Sheriff's Pit. You can see it's a drift mine taken in the year 1900 by Thomas Smith. The entrance to the mine was propped up by wooden stakes and the tubs were used to carry the ironstone out of the mine. 
Okay, so moving on to Blakey Junction, a very, very famous part of the Rosedale Railway. During the height of the Rosedale Railway and the ironstone industry, Blakey uh, Junction was the focal point for wagons leaving the Dale for Teesside. When the trains carried the calcined ironstone, it had been uh, basically roasted in those kilns, those ovens, across Blakey Junction, onto the High Moor, and down into Teesside via something called the Ingleby Incline. In Teesside, the ironstone was used for iron and steel manufacturing. Now, after being unloaded, the wagons were refilled with coal and other supplies and returned to Rosedale to repeat the process. So here's a couple of pictures of uh, Bakey Station and the same landscape today that you can see there. Again, this, this famous picture by Joseph Broughton, um, taken in 1890, we can see the families and railway workers of Rosedale's uh, at Blakey Junction. We can see that some of the people kind of casually standing by the railway or on the railway line itself. Uh, they mustn't have minded having the railway coming so close to where their homes were. Now, if you follow the Rosedale Railway um, round from uh, Blakey Junction, you'll see the remains of a water tower, which are located on the incline from the head of the dale towards Blakey Junction. Now, there's a slight incline on this, so trains could take on more water from this water tower before they prepared to travel a steady gradient upwards towards Blakey Junction. Now, the remains that you can see here are of Rosedale Black Houses, the remains of workers' cottages and outhouse workstations located very near to the iron and stone kilns, the east kilns, which you can see in the background here. Now, they were called black houses due to being coated in bitumen to make them weatherproof. And what remains standing is a single story extension, which was originally a wash house. So again, we can see a nice uh, images here of the black, black houses through time. We can see how gradually through time, more and more of the building has been sort of weathered away and decayed. And again, that just shows us the importance of looking after our heritage as well. Okay, so the Rosedale East Kilns are the most northerly set of arch kilns within the valley and are sometimes referred to as the East Kilns. Now, during the boom years of Rosedale's ironstone mining, the kilns were one of three sets where ironstone was calcined or roasted. Now, they were all built in the 1860s to process ironstone, which was mined beneath the moor to the east. Now, the surviving remains of these three enormous kiln compartments lined with fire bricks originally contained massive iron fronts. There's two different sets, and you can see in the picture at the bottom, they originally contained iron fronts. Now above the kilns were drift mines which went up to three miles into the dale side and by 1873 1,600 tons a day of calcined ironstone was being transported by rail. When the mining came to an end work continued in removing the calcined waste heaps and 230,000 tons of this reddish material which you can still sometimes see in the natural environment today were removed by rail from 1920 onwards. When the railway closed in 1929 the tracks and equipment were salvaged and sold off. Now you get a really good sense of the railway here and you can see there the sort of remains of the kilns here on the left hand side and you can uh, see um, above the kilns on the left hand side are bunkers for coal storage to feed into the calcining kilns. Rail wagons were shunted over the wooden bunkers and the trapdoors and the wagons were opened releasing coal into bunkers. You can also get a perspective of what it looks like today. So you can still see very much the outline of where the railway would have been leading um, to the kilns on the east side of Rosedale. And here you can see a sort of a before, well, today picture and then a picture of what the stone kilns looked like in 1927 as well. And you can just see that distinctive chimney in the background, too. OK, so the last place we're going to talk about is the Ingleby Incline. The Ingleby Incline marked the point where the railway carrying the ironstone from Rosedale left the moors and dropped down to Cleveland at a rate of up to one in five. Loaded wagons were attached to steel ropes nearly a mile long and wrapped around a large brake drum. They were lowered down the slope, pulling empty wagons up the hill at the same time. Now, today it's a beautiful and peaceful place, but at the time of the Industrial Revolution, it would have been full of noise. So we've seen lots and lots of evidence for Rosedale and the Industrial Revolution within the landscape today still can tell us that story, uh, that unique story of Rosedale during the Industrial Revolution. OK, thanks very much for listening to that Meanwhile Nearby about Rosedale during the Industrial Revolution. Thank you very much. Bye bye.